Okay, guys, so this is a short continuation of our conversation surrounding art and design and kind of investigating um, four specific ways in which we see kind of this separation between art and design um, sort of occurring. And again, these are very fluid um, and not necessarily sort of strict definitions. So like I said, we're going to talk about four sort of categories of defining and thinking about art and design and sort of separating them, um, but also talking about their similarities as well. So those are purpose, originality, viewer and audience, um, as well as maker. And like I said, all of these things are going to cross over between art and design all the time. Um, as artists and art historians, we should constantly keep this in mind. I don't think that you um, are, you guys are sort of um, don't understand this concept at all. I think you have a pretty good sort of understanding as artists, um, because probably many of you consider yourselves artists and designers. So um, we're going to talk about these things and then you'll probably see where you feel like they overlap as well. Okay, so purpose is the first one here. Um, so making art from um, deep within to share with others um, is very much connected to art, typically relates and inspires. It's not confined to specific rules. Artists are free to express themselves, um, typically has to do with painting, sculptures, and a lot of different types of mediums um, and sort of explorations. And um, a quote from online is good art inspires. I've sort of collected this information from some different sources. Now for a designer, on the other hand, um, designer is not trying to convey something new, but an idea that already exists. It is calculated and defined process with goals, uh, color, style, function, and details. Um, architecture, interior design, landscape design, product design. So think about the production of buildings um, as well as sort of landscaping and interior design. Though again, that can be very much sort of artistic. Um, can be as simple as utilitarian object like a tool and functionality and then good design motivates. So art continues to establish a strong bond between artist and viewer. Art not made with specific rules, simplicity or strength, love or pain. Um, it can be sort of any theme, idea, concept that the artist could be focusing on. While on the other hand, design is driven by consumer and it's calculating. They're trying to make a specific project that meets specific criteria. How do you make um, so-and-so better? So how do you make a better chair, a better pen, a better program. Um, designing is systemic, systematic, sy systemic. Uh, it involves the analysis of problems and situations in the built environment, the transformation of binding, bindings into appropriate and useful proposals. And that's from Frank Lloyd Wright. And here's some quotes as well. And I don't necessarily agree with all of these, but these are definitely some ideas that are kind of out there. So um, good art is introspective, feeling to individuals. Good design sends the same message to everyone. So it is the idea that when you design something, you're trying to get a particular message across, get someone to buy something, to think about an object differently. Whereas good art can really kind of make you make anyone feel sort of any variety of feelings. So that's reflected again in this other um, poster here on the bottom left. Art stimulates different meanings for different individuals and design delivers a consistent message. Here are some quotes by a designer, Massimo Vignelli. Um, design is not art, design is utilitarian, art is not, um, which I tend to disagree with. And in design, be logical, search for truth, be clear. Okay, so I'm going to also give you some examples of these things as we kind of move through. So what are some examples of um, art's purpose in purpose in creating it? So this is Caravaggio's Calling of St. Matthew that's in the Contarelli Chapel in Rome, uh, painted during the Baroque period. Caravaggio is a very famous painter during this time. Um, using sort of oil paints to create this work. And he's very sort of known for using this deep sense of lighting in many of his paintings to make these sort of very dramatic scenes. So Baroque is always about, uh, and Baroque is right after the Renaissance, so Baroque is very much about focusing on the most dramatic and powerful moment in a story. Um, so taking that and amplifying it 
um, in a painting or a sculpture, etc. And so in Caravaggio's work, he does this um, with the calling of St. Matthew, where you have Christ, who is here on the right, um, calling St. Matthew, who is here right here, pointing to himself, to come be one of his disciples. So this very sort of particular moment um, that's very powerful. And you have the shining of the light that's reflected directly on um, Matthew, but kind of skips over Christ over the top here. You can see his halo um, and it kind of lights up his hand here. Now, um, as a viewer in um, the 16th century to 17th century, you would know that this figure with Christ is St. Peter um, because he's always sort of dressed the same way. So in this sort of blue garment um, with yellow uh, frock around here. So um, this is sort of iconographic that this is him standing with St. Peter. Um, and so Christ has gone into this, um, in this case, a bar to call St. Matthew to follow him. Now, another powerful moment about this image is also that Caravaggio is painting a contemporary scene to his time period. So all these people are in contemporary dress, um, other than St. Peter to some effect. Um, but this is a contemporary scene in this kind of nitty gritty place in society. So they're gambling, they're in a bar or some sort of sketchy establishment. Um, and so Caravaggio is painting this very powerful scene with sort of contemporary imagery and contemporary clothing very much so to connect to make the viewer connect with the image so um even to the point that he places this opening at the table so you can feel like you are invited up to the table here um but he's very much doing that in this painting and not only of course is he doing that but he's also reflecting on sort of art historical tradition of um looking back at other paintings and um, he does that through this hand here um, in which where Christ is sort of having this um, pointing to Matthew in this very sort of I don't know like laissez-faire way um, but of course if you don't recognize it right away um, he is reflecting on Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel ceiling where you have God sort of reaching out to um, Adam um, and this sort of moment um, on the Sistine Chapel ceiling. So he's reflecting in that, entering the Christ figure with his hand out like this. So the purpose of Caravaggio painting this painting um, in the sort of 16th to 17th century was that Caravaggio was contracted by the Catholic Church to bring people back into the church community and back to Christ, back to God. Um, it was very much sort of a divisionist time um, where you had people going um, and separating themselves from the Catholic Church because of corruption, while also having people um, move into the Lutheran Church because we've had Martin Luther come through with his theses. And so people are separating themselves from the Catholic Church, finding them to be corrupt. Um, and so Caravaggio is contracted by the Catholic Church to create these powerful pieces of art to bring people back to the Catholic Church, whether that be through sort of inherent fear or through sort of um, showing them these very powerful images in contemporary clothing to sort of bring them back into the church. And so the power of this image and its purpose very much kind of reflects its power as an image um, at that time and what the purpose was, right? But people would have interpreted it differently depending on if um, they had separated themselves from the Catholic Church, if they knew Caravaggio, um, et cetera. So you would have sort of different interpretations, although there's kind of this larger purpose, right, why it's created. Um, we don't know sort of all of the reasons why Caravaggio made all the choices that he did. Um, some people would catch Michelangelo's um, hand while others would not, and so, people were able to connect with this image in very sort of particular ways, depending on their own sort of personal interpretations and sort of lives um, separate from the Catholic Church. Well, on the other hand, um, you can think about advertising as sort of the other hand to thinking about purpose um, with a piece of design here. So this is an advertisement for Absolute Vodka for LA um, from the 1990s. And these are supposed to be sort of very straightforward um, pieces of advertisement. So 
Here you have that um, Absolute is trying to get this sense of paradise with the palm trees and um, vacation and relaxation um, in making the Absolute vodka bottle the um, pool itself. And there are so many different messages that they portray, such as that they're connected to artists and they're interested in innovation. So here's an artist that creates um, a version of the Absolute bottle. I think it, there's a YouTube video um, in the notes that you can watch of her creating it um, by Baharti Care, but um, showing that they're connected to art and to revolution and to sort of um, what's popular today. Same with sort of going back and having images of um, Absolute Godka with Keith Haring or Andy Warhol. They're trying to connect with this sort of artistic community and also show how cool they are, how powerful they are. So it, the message on all these things, right, is trying to get you to drink vodka, right? Trying to get you to drink absolute vodka versus sort of a competitor. And so the purpose is very direct. Um, and even though Caravaggio's may seem just as direct, um, it doesn't end with sort of the same um, effect as something like absolute vodka advertising or any other advertising for that effect. Um, and Hennessy does this too. Like a lot of alcohol companies try to make you feel like they're cool, they're hip. Why do you want to buy them? Um, so Hennessy always does these sort of um, collaborations with artists. So um, Vils is a street artist. And he produced a collector's edition of the Hennessy bottle. A lot of street artists have done this, um, but it's really neat to see these collaborations and this way that they're kind of engaging with advertisement as well as sort of the contemporary community. Um, so that's really awesome. And also, again, about bringing people into that community, right? Why would we be talking about Hennessy if they weren't doing this? No, of course not. Um, and so they're very much sort of bringing themselves into that dialogue very purposefully with this sort of piece of design, right? Even though it's artistic. Another example I have just that I thought of it off the top of my head um, is Hoover vacuums. Obviously, a vacuum is a piece of design, right? You want it to work well. It's not necessarily always super attractive, though I feel like Dyson always kind of shows their pieces of works of art. Um, but in um, Hoover vacuums, they're very much a piece of design. They have to work, they have to do their job, etc. cetera. Um, versus Jeff Koons has um, many works of art where he has taken old vintage Hoovers and put them into sort of glass cases as pieces of art. So he's turned these design objects into pieces of art that will never work in their sort of traditional way. And so has created them and moved them from their purpose of sort of um, cleaning, right, or doing their function to pieces of art. Okay, so next is originality. Um, in art, it's usually based on the artist and their own personal individuality. Um, good art has taste and is unique or new, um, open to lots of interpretation, doesn't often have just sort of one particular interpretation or idea. So it is open to a lot of different ideas and um, interpretations based upon the viewer and their own sort of personal experiences, like we talked about with Caravaggio's work. Then, on the other hand, design is kind of based on trend. So you don't necessarily want it to be unique. You want it to be based kind of on something that is particular, is straightforward, um, and kind of based in the trends of what's going on today, what's interesting, what's valuable, um, what do people need, what do they not need. Um, it doesn't have to be good for you to understand what it's conveying, like advertisement or format text it has to make sense and usually convey a very particular message. Okay, so here we have a lamp um, by Tiffany. Um, instead of being sort of a purely functional design object that's meant to do sort of a specific thing, um, instead we have here sort of a very sort of fanciful, um, highly sort of artistic interpretation of um, a lamp. So not something that's directly functional, um, other than it, yes, it does work like a lamp, um, but it's about sort of the um, the name Tiffany, as well as the creativity and using stained glass and the type of sort of foliage um, that the sort of Tiffany studio produced. Versus on the other hand, you have sort of purely functional objects like sort of traditional lamps um, as a whole. There's obviously um, places where art and design overlap in sort of lighting, and well, I'm going to show you a couple examples, but 
these are sort of straight up functional design objects, right? They do their job, they do them well, um, and people are continuing to try to improve them. On the other hand, you can see art and design come together in things like um, Ikea lamps or other productions where they're thinking not only about sort of the functionality of the object, um, but also how they work in the space, um, connecting with kind of interior design and other elements as well. So um, you can think about the Bajas, right? These are some Bajas um, light fixtures. How are they similar or different um, in connecting with sort of art versus design, right? We study um, Bajas when we talk about art and art history. Is it a piece of design or um, is it a piece of art or is it both? So like I said, these things cross over. They're very connected and interconnected with one another in the way that we think about objects being produced. The third section is art um, versus design in viewer and audience. So um, for art, good art is interpreted and has multiple interpretations by each audience member. No one person can have the exact same interpretation. Art is not necessarily interested in expressing just sort of one opinion. And then the building of research and ideas by art historians to understand these moments and artists. Um, versus good design is understood and not meant to be interpreted. I want viewer to have one unambiguous interpretation, trying to convey a particular message to the audience and successful when it does this. So again, this very much connects back up to um, purpose um, as well as... I just... Originality. So in thinking about... Um, how people sort of interpret them and think about them. So, for example, um, Kandinsky is a very famous um, modern art painter and abstract painter as well. Um, and his compositions can be interpreted very differently by different people. Um, he's not trying to sort of convey sort of one story or one narrative, um, but instead to have you sort of engage um, artistically with the painting um, and to think about sort of how it makes you feel, what it makes you emote, what it emotes, um, etc. cetera. Um, versus again, when thinking about kind of viewer audience here, um, Guy Moore is advertising, creating advertising for McDonald's in um, these images. And so he's trying to do something that's bright, that catches your attention, um, that tells you something specific. And so here you have him using, uh, making a, what is that on the left? An Egg McMuffin, um, and then fries, and then a burger. And so, and using them um, and creating them with sort of iPhones, right? So using technology and thinking about technology um, because he's trying to tell you that mobile ordering is here um, and you can now um, order McDonald's um, on your phone. And so using phones to create these very famous images of um, fast food. He also created this very particular messaging of um, using the billboards to sort of tell you where um, your particular exit was to get McDonald's. Um, and in doing this kind of uses this design tactic um, to put the um, golden arches on a particular area in the billboard to sort of give people an idea of where they need to be going, right? So um, on your left, on your right is makes sense. Um, next exit, right? This looks like an exit off the highway. And then you just missed us, right? This is a turning around, right? This is a like a U-turn. So using um, these sort of typical images that drivers understand and maybe people who um, are looking for food or looking for McDonald's to sort of immediately understand what Guy Moore is trying to tell us in these um, pieces of advertisement slash design. I definitely think, again, crossovers, keep thinking about crossovers, right? So here we have um, two posters designs for the film Vertigo, um, one by Saul Bass on the left, um, and then one of the traditional ones from the right when the um, Vertigo originally came out. So um, Saul Bass is typically considered a designer. He designs these um, very famous sort of abstract versions of um, masterpiece films like Alfred Hitchcock's film, um, like Vertigo. And 
creates these really sort of gorgeous simplified images to give you a sense of what is going on in the film um, in this very sort of minimalistic way. And so not only is he using design to sort of bring down all of these kind of chaotic elements of the right cover um, into the left cover, but also to sort of portray a particular message um, and idea. And but this is very much sort of considered on the cusp of what is art and what is design, right? Um, does it give you the same interpretation for every person? Um, it's hard to say, right? These are some other images of Saul Bass um, posters as well. Uh, so this last one is art versus design the maker so um and this is one that i kind of disagree about um like i talked about in class um good art is talent um i don't necessarily think that good art is talent and good design is skill um think about how those are sort of intrinsically corrupt in that you obviously have to practice to be a good artist as well um but good art is supposedly i put air quotes though you can't see me um artistic license of an individual have to have some sort of ability to, and desire to make art um versus a designer can learn design usually needs to be learned to understand what people like and interpret that to make good design um and then you have sort of the series of um, tests that people go through to sort of decide if audience understands what's going on in the image what's important about the image um etc so um, I definitely think Maker is a big proponent to understanding kind of art versus design because it usually tells you like if they're an artist or designer um, because usually a person will have a preference. Um, so Philip Tracy, for example, is a very famous um, artist in that he creates these very sort of fantastical hats, but they have this very sort of functional purpose um, in that people do wear them, right? So um, this is Kate Middleton wearing one on the right here um, as well as this one. Here's Meghan Markle wearing them as well. So very much more part of sort of British society and culture than it is about, um, is in our culture. And then you have sort of the utilitarian version, right? The design version where you have sort of Nike producing hats that do what they're supposed to do, right? They have the swoosh on them to identify what brand they are. Um, but it is also about sort of the um, function of the hat. Does it keep the sun out of your eyes? Um, is it a valuable hat, right, et cetera. So, and of course those things, again, crossover, 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 right? Um, Philip Tracy and Alexander McQueen have worked on hats. Um, these are definitely not functional in any sort of capacity. They're very artistic, very avant-garde, um, not things that would function in sort of daily life in any capacity. Uh, and of course, he's produced the hats for Lady Gaga as well. So he's very famous for that. But these sort of hats that are much more whimsical, a part of this sort of staged costuming um, is very different from sort of the design elements of um, a traditional hat, quote unquote hat. Um, I just learned recently that he also made the hats in Harry Potter for um, the F Fleur Delacroix um, group of wizards which is neat. Um, and again, you can think about this as shoes as well. So you have Kobe Bryant's um, design version on the right versus a Keith Haring version of a shoe. Um, which one is more functional? Which works better? Um, are they comfortable? Do um, they have value as sort of a shoe, right? Are you going to wear the Keith Haring shoes? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but there's all of these sort of connections between artists producing not only sort of functional objects, but also sort of um, artistic versions of those objects as well. So like I said, there's very much a separation in the way that you can think about art and design, but I don't necessarily think the separation is valuable or important. Um, there's very much so a inherent connection between the two things, right? There's art can be design, design can be art, um, a visual composition intended to accomplish a specific task or communicate a particular message, no matter how beautiful is not art. Um, it's not necessarily true, right? Um, design objects can be art, art can be design. It is not that sort of straightforward, I don't think. Um, and that's maybe just my opinion, but 
it seems to me that in some of these articles that you'll be reading this week for your assignment that um designers have this inherent intent to separate themselves um from artists and i don't really see the point of that i think that they're very sort of intrinsically intertwined um that that space between art and design is very very important to how we understand both sort of um concepts as a whole so we'll see if you agree or disagree with me <laughs>